Oops. Emily's going to be a talking logo. I'm going to go on mute, so I won't be talking much. <laughs> oh, you'll Good. let us know when to start, right? Yes, I will. Two minutes. OK. Or just a few minutes. Yeah, let me check the Facebook feed. just asked a little question here i'm curious and this is for the chat but i'm curious if anybody here attending is currently outside of austin i know some people are oh we got somebody here in chicago welcome All right chicago i love chicago i was there in 2018 my band played progtoberfest that was fun yes the pizza there is very good Peoria, Illinois, welcome. A lot of people from the areas. I knew somebody when I was Chicago, Peoria. I was a music camp counselor. One of the counselors in my unit was from Peoria. He was going to music school there. All right, y'all, we're, we're all set and it's seven, so we can go ahead and get started. Excellent. All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Johnny Gowdy. I'm a musician here in Austin and host of the podcast, How Did I Get Here? And I work with the Austin Music Foundation. Thanks for joining us. We hope you're all safe and in good health. Welcome to Austin Music Foundation and Accountable First, uh, sorry, Accountable Artists Present Accounting Crash Course for Creatives, a two-part webinar series on the art of bookkeeping and accounting for creative entrepreneurs. This series is for anyone running their own businesses, but some information will be tailored specifically to independent artists and musicians, freelance industry professionals, music photographers, and other creative businesses. For those of you who are new to the Austin Music Foundation, we're a 501c3 nonprofit arts organization whose core mission is to strengthen, connect, and advance the local community and industry. We do this through educational programming, exactly like this, professional development, focus mentoring through one-on-one -on -one consultation and networking opportunities. Austin Music Foundation was established in 2002 and remains one of the city's only service organizations dedicating to delivering year round businesses, oh, sorry, business training at no cost to the music community. For more information on AMF programs or to get involved, check us out at austinmusicfoundation.org. On March 27th, in direct response to the COVID-19 crisis and cancellation of South by Southwest, Austin Music Foundation host, start, began hosting educational webinars in an effort to help musicians and industry professionals navigate the music business during these unprecedented and challenging times. Tonight, we are pleased to partner with Aaron Clift of, of The Accountable Artist to bring you essential information related to bookkeeping and accounting now is a better time than any to get your financial house in order. We'll save thank yous and comments for the end. And at around eight o'clock, we'll open up the floor to Q&A. So please leave your questions in the comments section and Aaron will do his best to answer them. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, Aaron Clift of The Accountable Artist. Hey guys. Johnny, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you for having me here. So. I want to ask you guys a question. I know you, I can't see, see you, but you can see me, but I will ask you this. 
does accounting make you feel like this? I know when I started doing accounting about 16 years ago, this is how I felt trying to understand it. So I know what it's like to be in that situation. And if you've ever felt like any of these poor people here, I'm going to try and make your life a little bit easier. So just a little bit about me and my background. I am a vocalist and keyboardist. I've been professionally in the Austin music scene since 2008. I have my own band, the Aaron Clift Experiment. And in addition to my career in music, I've also been pursuing a professional accounting career. I've worked with everything from companies that had about 10 employees. Uh, and currently my day job, I am working with a company that employs about 20,000 people. So I've run the gamut from small to big companies and done kind of all accounting operations in between that. I am a QuickBooks Advanced Certified Pro Advisor. So for those of you who are not familiar, QuickBooks is probably the number one accounting software for small to medium-sized businesses. And QuickBooks Online is the software that I use for all of my accounting for my businesses, and I love it. I love it so much that I recently did the certification exam, so I am like a black belt in QuickBooks. And I have been teaching accounting professionally since 2019, although it kind of started before then. I noticed that a lot of my music friends, when they found out that I also had a career in accounting, they would come to me with just a variety of questions, much like the ones that I've seen with some of the people who have registered for this course. And I would give them advice and, and give them suggestions on things. And before long, a lot of people were telling me, why don't you, why don't you teach this stuff to other creative people out there? You seem to have a good knack for that. And so I, I pulled a couple of my close musician friends last year about this, and they were overwhelmingly interested in this. And so that was kind of how the Accountable Artist started. And so my goal with the Accountable Artist is to make accounting and understanding money less intimidating for creative people. I know that musicians, we kind of have a reputation for being very creative, but when it comes to left brain activities, we struggle a lot. I'm going to tell you right now, that's actually false because it's not that we can't handle it. It's just, they don't teach this stuff in school. Like I went through school. I got my degree in music and Spanish. I never took an accounting course in my life. I had to learn this on my own, but I will say this, that the pattern recognition that comes with learning how to read sheet music, learning all the theory, learning how to do songs. I think that comes in really handy for understanding accounting because it's really at the end of the day, it's another language that you're going to learn and it's pattern recognition. And so what I've observed about musicians is that I think musicians learn accounting more quickly than any other creative profession out there. So if you guys are struggling with this and you want to get ahead, I'm going to help you do that. So let's talk a little bit about what we're going to go over tonight and next week. So tonight is part one. And like any discipline, before you can really get into actually doing this stuff, you kind of need to know the theory behind it. So tonight, I'm going to give you guys the theory and that's going to include just some getting started hints. Uh, talking about what accounts are, what a chart of accounts is, and whether you should be using accrual basis accounting or cash basis accounting. Next week, we're going to get more into applying all the lessons that we learned tonight. So please be sure to tune in next week if you're wondering, hey, when are we going to actually use this stuff? Uh, there will be a recording available after this is over. AMF will be posting that on their website. And uh, the presentation that I'm doing tonight will be available as a PDF that you can download. So you're welcome to take notes tonight, but don't feel like you have to. 
So the, just a couple things that this course doesn't cover. I am not going to talk about personal finances because I assume all of you are here to learn more about how to run your business. So we will not be going over that. I'm not going to explain to you how to make and invest money. If you do have questions about that, uh, you'll want to consult a financial advisor. They can help you figure out how to do that. Uh, there were some questions that I saw ahead of time that do pertain to starting a business, and I can address those at the end, but this conversation tonight will not really get into that part of it because I want to spend the time really getting deep into the theory of accounting and understanding kind of the nuts and bolts of how this works. And lastly, I'm not going to go over taxes. I, I know that's really a burning question on everyone's mind, especially with the deadline being in two weeks. Um, I do know quite a bit about taxes, but if you have questions that are really specific to your situation, I will use the disclaimer that I always use that I am not a CPA, uh, certified public accountant. So I am probably not the best person to ask about very specific tax questions. If you are ever in doubt about any of this, consult a CPA. And if you need any recommendations of CPAs, I can email that to you. And I will provide you with my contact information at the end of the presentation. So with that out of the way, let's get started. I like to use funny graphics. And uh, <laughs> if you see this kid right here, this is exactly how I felt when I learned accounting for the first time, it kind of blew my mind. So I am gonna teach you some stuff tonight that will probably open your mind, make you think about money in some ways that you may have not thought before. So this is a really important question. It's kind of at the heart of what drives accounting. What does it actually mean to be in business? So we use that expression a lot. And a lot of people, may have different opinions about that, but really what it comes down to is if you are engaging in commercial, industrial, or professional activities with a profit mo motive, which is going to be the majority of you, or if you're a nonprofit entity, it would be a charitable motive, you are in business. So notice I didn't say that you have to be actually making money to be in business. It's not that you have made money, it's that you are intending to make money, and that is the key. So just remember that the moment you've decided, hey, you know what, I intend to make money from my music, and you know, you want to make this your living, you are in business. What is accounting? Accounting is the art of organizing, maintaining, and analyzing financial activities. And I say it is an art because I think of it very much like music, that there are kind of the, there's the theory part, there are the nuts and bolts that build it up, just like any other language and any other art. And so tonight we are going to learn a little bit about how we organize and maintain and analyze financial activities. Why do you want to learn accounting? So a lot of people tend to only approach accounting when they need to file their taxes. But I think it's important to realize that when we do accounting, whether we like it or not, it is an essential part of running our business. and. I'm going to give you guys a couple of reasons why I think it's really important that anybody in business needs to know this skill. First of all, understanding accounting will save you time and money. So think about it this way. If you are waiting until tax season to work on your finances, that's kind of like trying to learn how to play a song two hours before you go on for a show. Now, it's possible you might do okay, but I wouldn't risk it. I think it's important to practice every single day 
when we do music. And so it's kind of the same way with your finances. You want to be constantly looking at this because you want to understand where you are as a business owner. And when you get down to tax time, having a complete picture of your business is going to save you a lot of time, a lot of scrambling around. And when you know how you're doing financially, it's also going to help you spend money and pursue your business activities more wisely. So it will save you money in the long run. As I mentioned just now, it will definitely make your tax time easier. Uh, I don't like to wait until a week or two before taxes are done to get my taxes done. I try to get them done as soon as possible because usually I can get some sort of refund. But even if you are not necessarily going to get a refund, you still want to get your taxes done sooner rather than later. I just view it as one of those things you want to get done and get it over with. And so understanding your accounting will make tax time easier. Uh, another reason is your professional image. So how many people do you know who are experts in accounting? Probably not that many, but if you're ever trying to get a business loan or you're trying to present yourself to uh, other professionals in your industry, having an understanding of accounting and how your money works is going to put you ahead of probably 90 to 99% of those people. And so that can really make a difference for you. That can help you in the future with getting loans. It can help you just appear more knowledgeable in your field. So I think it's really important to know these things. So who does accounting? I really think of it two ways. So you've got your bookkeeper. That's the person who's going to be recording financial activities of the business. And then there is the CPA, Certified Public Accountants. And that is the person who classifies, summarizes, and interprets transactions. So you can think of it as like the bookkeeper is the person who is doing the day-to-day -day financial transactions. And the accountant is going to be the person who's going to classify, summarize all that data, and usually they're doing the taxes for a business, so they're going to file the taxes. Now, when you're doing your own accounting on a day-to-day -day business, you are the bookkeeper. It's also possible that you might be filing your own taxes, in which case you can be your own accountant. There's kind of a common misconception that you need a CPA in order to file taxes. But I bet for the vast majority of you, you could probably do it on your own. It's really a matter of understanding how your accounting works. I use TurboTax to file my taxes and it makes it a lot easier than having to go through those really scary IRS forms. I don't like those, but with TurboTax, it just kind of walks me through and, and helps me and asks me questions in plain English. And as long as I have my accounting data for my business, I can get it done pretty quickly. So you guys, at the very least, I want you to learn how to be your own bookkeeper. And if you are up to the challenge, you might become your own accountant as well. So there's one of the most important things I always tell people, and I see this time and time again, is that you need to keep your business and personal finances separate. So especially if you're a, if you're an entrepreneur, right? You might be a self-employed musician. You might be doing a lot of freelance work. It might be hard to think of that as like you and your business are separate things because it's like, well, it's just me, right? Why do I need to do this? Well, I'm going to give you a couple of reasons. First one is tax reasons. So when you fill out your taxes on an annual basis, there's a separate form that you have to fill out for your business income. And if you are not keeping your business finances and your personal finances separate, 
it can be really difficult to get that information together. And so you really want to make sure that you are keeping everything for your business in your business pile, everything for your personal in your personal pile. Save time and money. Always important. Doesn't matter how you're doing financially, whether you had a killer year or a bad year, you always want to save time and money. And if you don't have your business and personal finances separate, it can be really, really time consuming to kind of untangle everything. I, I've worked with many musicians. Uh, I remember working with a musician once who kept all of his finances in one set of books. And I asked him why he did that. And he told me, well, I, I have a lot of different things I do here and there. You know, I do some, some ride sharing. I do rent out my house and stuff. But when you have different things that you're doing that don't relate to your business and you've got them in your business books, it can really muddy the waters and it can make it very difficult to figure out really how your business is doing. So you want to save time and money by not having to worry about untangling that. And of course, your professional image. So if you ever want to apply for a business loan, which I know a lot of people have been doing that lately with the Paycheck Protection Program and various other programs that have come out this year, if you don't have a clean set of books, then it's going to really count against you and make it very difficult to get the kind of credit you need. So very important, keep your business and personal finances separate. And lastly, of course, as I mentioned, establishing business credit. So uh, just like you have personal credit, your business can also develop credit. And so that can affect how you get loans. Uh, it can affect many other things. And so you want to be building your business credit separately from your personal credit whenever you can. So keep your business and personal finances separate. One of the dangers I see with not separating your business and personal finances is what I call commingling. So when you don't keep the two separate from each other, we can have a lot of problems. So let me give you a couple examples of where I see this happen the most. If you use the same bank account for your business and personal finances, you are commingling. If you deposit payments from your clients in your personal bank account, that is also commingling. If you pay for personal expenses with your business money, that is also commingling. Likewise, if you are paying for business expenses from your personal funds, you are commingling. So we talked about why you don't want to do it. So then the question is, okay, well, how do I separate my business and personal finances? I'm going to give you guys a few ways you can do that. They're very easy. You can implement them today. First one, this is the easiest one to do open a business bank account. If you call up your bank and tell them, hey, I've got my own business. I need to set up a business account. They'll only ask you for a few things and you can get that set up in 10 minutes. Um, this one I recommend to a lot of people, especially in the state of Texas, incorporating your business. And I'm not going to get into all the specifics today about how that works, but when you start doing business, you are a sole proprietor. So it doesn't matter if you've filed any paperwork with the IRS. The moment you have a profit motive and you are in business, you are a sole proprietor. Now, you can incorporate your business. There are a variety of different designations that you can have. Uh, this does give you a certain amount of protection between your personal assets and your business assets. Uh, as I said, though, I'm not going to get into all that. If you have questions about that, I can probably answer them separately, or 
um, I can refer you to some CPAs who might be able to help you and figure out how to set up your business. And then lastly, I always recommend to people use financial software for your business. If you're not comfortable with that, you can always use a spreadsheet. There, are, That's a pretty basic way to do it. I think, honestly, QuickBooks is the best one that I've used. It's super easy. It doesn't take very long to master it, and you don't have to be a financial genius to figure it out. So those are three things you can do right away to prevent yourself from commingling and get your business and personal finances separate from each other. All right, let's get into accounting theory. So that's kind of my lengthy getting started preamble. Now we're going to get to the meat and potatoes of things. So let's get some definitions out of the way. What is an account? Now, I've got some pictures here of some folders because I, I think that's a good visual analogy to think about what an account is. An account is a record that's used to store transactions. And the complete set of accounts for a business is sometimes referred to as the books, but more often is referred to as a general ledger. So you might be familiar with when people say account, you're probably thinking bank account. Bank account is a type of account, but there are many, many other types of accounts as well. So we're going to get to all of them today all the main types of accounts. I just want you to be aware that when we talk about accounts in accounting, we're not just talking about bank accounts. We are talking about the whole gamut of them. So what are the five types of accounts? So just like you, know, you can think about in music, you know, you've got all your note names, you've got C all the way up to, you know, all the 12 notes there in Western tuning. We've got five different types of accounts, and these are the building blocks for all the accounting transactions that we are going to do. First one is assets, and this is everything that your company owns. You can think of that kind of in two broad categories. There are tangible assets. That would be everything like cash that you have, any equipment that you have, if you own land, that kind of stuff. Anything that you can tangibly hold in your hand or see in front of you. And then you have intangible assets. That would be stuff like if you own a trademark, logo, any copyrights. So for you musicians out there, any uh, recording copyrights that you have, those are assets. Now, the opposite of an asset is a liability. This is, so if you think of assets, the stuff that you own, liabilities are things that you owe to other people. So an example of that would be a loan. Somebody loans you money, you owe that to that person. We call that a loan payable. Accounts payable is somebody gives you a bill, then that money that you owe goes into accounts payable. Uh, if you have bonds, anything like that, those are all liabilities. Equity, which is also known as capital, is a way that defines how much your business is worth. So when you start a business, there's a good chance that when you open up a bank account, you are going to put maybe $100 into your bank account. That money that you're putting into your bank account is equity. That is money that you are putting into your business. As your business starts to earn money and build up that capital, you are increasing your equity. Expenses, I think we are all very familiar with this one. These are the costs that you have occur that occur during your business operations and of course income 
Income is also known as revenue, and this is the money that you earn from selling goods and services. It could be anything from music merchandise to playing shows to maybe managing a band, taking photography, anything that you're doing that's earning you money, that is your income. So I'm going to show you next how all these five types of accounts interact with each other. Now this is the core of business accounting. It's called the accounting equation. What the accounting equation says is that your business equity equals your assets minus your liabilities. So think about that for a moment. When we talked about equity a moment ago, that's kind of like what your business is worth, right? That's your capital. So you can think of that like assets here is stuff that you own. Liabilities is stuff that you owe to other people. So if you think about it, it kind of makes sense, right? The assets, the stuff that you owe minus the stuff that you owe to other people equals your total business equity. I'm going to give you a couple examples here to show you how this works. So let's do a really easy example. Now, in all these examples, we're going to assume that this is the only accounting transaction in the entire company. So we're going to just pretend like this is the only one here. So let's say you got David here. And David has a bank account that has $100 in it. And he owes $50 to Beth for graphic design work. So let's first, the accounting equation is equity equals assets minus liabilities. So the next thing to do is, OK, so we know that's the equation. So what are the accounts in this example? In this case, we are trying to figure out the equity. We have a bank account. And we have accounts payable. The bank account is the one that has $100. And he owes money to Beth for graphic design work. So that bill that he received from Beth is going to go into accounts payable. So now we just need to plug in the numbers in the right places. So here's his starting balance. He has $100 in his bank account. So his equity is 100 but now he owes this money to Beth. So what's going to happen to his equity? Well, he takes that $100 from his bank account and he subtracts the money that he owes to Beth because that was in accounts payable. So his new equity number is 50. And if this starts to look like algebra to you, it's because it is. I'm taking you back to math class. But you guys are all musicians, and musicians like math. I have found that musicians really pick up this stuff very quickly, and I think you guys will too. Let's do another example here. So let's say that Sarah's business bank account has $100 in it, and now she plays a gig and she earns $200 in cash. So go back to our accounting equation. Equity equals assets minus liabilities. OK, so what are the accounts in this equation? Well, we have her bank account, and we have the cash that she just earned. Now, notice this equation doesn't have any liabilities in it. That's OK. The important thing is that whatever you have on one side of the equation has to equal whatever is on the other side of the equation. So she starts off with $100 in her bank account, nothing else on the right side of the equation. So her equity equals 100. But now she's going to earn $200. She didn't have any liabilities to pay. So we don't subtract anything. In this case, we need to add 200 to both sides. And so her ending equity balance is 300 after she earns that $200. Last example for you guys. Jean has a business 
account, bank account that has $300 in it. And now she's going to withdraw $100 from the account. And she's going to move that to her personal bank account. So back to our accounting equation, equity equals assets minus liabilities. What are the accounts in this equation? Well, in this case, that money that she's withdrawing is actually, she is taking money out of the business. So when I said before that the equity is that money that you earn that is building up and building up and building up, that is your business equity. And if you ever move money outside of the business, like in this case where she withdraws some money and gives it to herself for her personal bank account, that is called a draw. So in this case, what we're saying here is that we're going to reduce her equity and her bank account is also going to be reduced, but there are no liabilities in this example. So her starting balance is she has $300 in her bank account, $300 in equity. But when she withdraws that $100, her equity is going down and her bank account. So end result here is $200 in her business bank account, $200 in equity. So you can see here from these three examples that really we can we can manipulate this equation in many different ways. The important thing is whatever you have on one side has to equal the total on the other side. All right, so this part right here, we talked about what accounts are. So you can think of each account as like a little folder or in this case is a super old fashioned example here, but this is kind of like a card catalog, right? So you can think of your chart of accounts as kind of like this filing cabinet right here that has all these different accounts in it. So <laughs> I've got the dog here with all the boxes. Chart of accounts is a listing of accounts by title and numerical description. Okay, well, what does that mean? Well, here is what I mean. So you've got your different account groups here. You got your assets, liabilities, equity, income, and then uh, cost of goods sold. I'm not gonna get into that tonight, but that is that would be grouped with expenses for the purpose of, of understanding this. And of course you have other income and other expenses. So like I said, we got our five types of, of accounts here. You got assets, liabilities, equity, income, expenses. And what we can do with these five really main groups of accounts is we can split them up into subgroups. So if you look in the second column here, there are special types of asset accounts. We have uh, accounts receivable, your business bank account and petty cash. As I mentioned before, a bank account is a type of asset account. Uh, your fixed assets, which would be, that would be like equipment or those tangible assets that I was telling you about. That is a type of tangible asset. Inventory, if you sell, if you're an online retailer, for example, or maybe you are selling banned merchandise, that is your inventory. And so that would be considered an asset. Uh, then we have other assets and other current assets, which are they, they're special types of assets. I won't get into all the details tonight, but just know that these are all the kind of subgroups out there. Under liabilities, we have accounts payable. So that that is specifically, it's money that you owe to other people, but those are like the bills that you receive from people all go into accounts payable. If you have a business credit card, that would be also a liability because you owe that money to the credit card company. Uh, Long-term liability would be something like maybe a loan. If you enrolled with the 
paycheck protection program that is a loan and you may potentially owe that money in the future possibly not really depends on your situation but that would be considered a long-term liability and then other current liabilities would be maybe money that you're going to pay off sooner like within the next few months i would say now if you look in column three on the right hand side here you see uh now this is not the only way that you can number things but this is this is definitely a way that if you number your accounts this way anybody who's a cpa will instantly understand what you're talking about this is the preferred method that i think for numbering accounts so uh i've seen it to where people use four digit numbers for their accounts and that's okay i like to use five digit numbers because if you're like me and you use a lot of different accounts then and you want to keep everything kind of organized a certain way it can be easier to add something when you have five digits to work with instead of four uh, you'll see here that the assets are numbered. Anything that really starts with the number one is an asset account. Anything that starts with two is a liability account. Three is equity. Four is going to be your regular income. Uh, five is cost of goods sold. And like I said, we're not going to get into cost of goods sold tonight, but that is something that is part of it's a special type of expense we'll say six thousand uh, anything that starts with a six are going to be your normal operating expenses uh seven other income so you may occasionally make a little bit of money that has nothing to do with your main business operations so i like to think of it like do you have a business savings account maybe you are earning a little bit of interest on your savings account that's where you would put that into other income. That's not really the main point of your business to make interest income unless you're a bank, but that's why I'd put it there. Other expenses are gonna be uh, not typical expenses that you would incur in your day-to-day. -day. We can go through a couple of them. In fact, now is a good segue. This is a chart of accounts. Now, I'm going to go through this very quickly. I don't have time to explain every single thing that's here. And especially since all of you are going to have access to this handout at the end of today, this is really more just for you to kind of get thinking about how accounting is organized. So this is based on the chart of accounts that I use for, for my own business, for my band. So we are in business to make money from live shows and selling music so the stuff that i have on here is going to really pertain to anybody who's a musician but if you're in an, another music field uh you know, like maybe you manage a band maybe you are doing um you know booking or music photography anything like that your chart of accounts may look a little bit different, but it'll still follow the same principles of accounting that we talked about. So what you see here is this right here is kind of your main account right here. This is, this is going to be like all my bank accounts and anything that starts with the same prefix here, it's just going to be a sub account of this. So you can think of this as like a little tree. So this is your top layer. This is your second layer. And so this is just my, these are all the bank accounts that I have. So maybe I have a checking account and a savings account. If I have cash, I, I like to put that in its own kind of category here, but that is a type of, it's like a type of bank account, but it's cash. Um, Accounts receivable, that's the when you send an invoice to somebody, if they owe you money, then you're going to record it here in accounts receivable. And then once they pay you, well, we'll get into that next week. But just want to get you thinking about that a little bit. Uh, 
you can see here, we talked about types of assets here. So my band, we have inventory. We have CDs because a lot of our fans like to buy physical copies of the album. If you release stuff digitally, you will not put that in inventory because it's not a physical item. You can't count it. Uh, if I loan money to somebody else, that would actually be an asset. Just like if I owe money to somebody else, that would be a liability. Uh, fixed assets right here. These are, um, I've divided it into different categories. There's, there's many ways you can do this, but this is a recommended way that I've seen. Um, putting equipment here, because you as musicians are probably going to accumulate a lot of equipment, a lot of expensive equipment. So, uh, and then, you know, furniture, appliances, fixtures, those kinds of things. I will not be getting into this tonight, but uh, I usually get into a lot of the more specialized types of accounts. If I had three or four lessons that I did. Since I'm only doing two, I'm not going to go into all this in detail, but uh, you're welcome to ask me if you have questions and, and contact me privately if you want to go into more depth with this stuff. Um, you can see here, these are all the different types of liability accounts. These are types of equity accounts here. I will be getting into some of the these accounts next week, though, because next week we're going to really go into how to build accounting transactions. And so I need to talk a little bit about what some of these things mean. Um, these are these are different income accounts. So you can see here with my band, I've kind of just made it simple. I have one main account called sales, and then these are all sub accounts here. So I've got sales for physical media so all my cd sales and we're probably going to release an album on vinyl so vinyl sales would go there uh i classify digital and streaming stuff into one account i find it easier to do it that way you don't have to do it that way you know you can really classify this stuff any way that makes sense to you this is just a way i recommend it to people uh, I put merchandise sales in its own category because I don't want to confuse t-shirt sales with my physical media sales. Uh, my performance income, any tips that I get when I'm playing live, that all goes there. If I earn any money from licensing and royalties, that would go there. So I know a lot of you are members of ASCAP or BMI or CSAC. I have a category for that. And then um, patron and crowdfunding income. So I know a lot of you probably have some sort of crowdfunding source that you're using. A lot of you might be on Patreon. I recommend having a category for that, but you could just as easily argue that maybe that kind of income belongs in, in music sales. I just like to put it here because I, I want to be able to report on that separately. You can think of all of these accounts here as boxes. And you're, every time you record an accounting transaction, you are putting like a little piece of paper in a box. And that's a record of what you did. And so you might want only a few boxes for your business. You might want many boxes for your business. I recommend trying to find a happy medium between the two. You don't want something overly complicated, but you do want to be as thorough as possible. And the reason I suggest that is, well, you don't want it to be too hard because then it becomes difficult for you to kind of manage. But you do need to be thorough because you want to know how all aspects of your business are doing. So. This is why um, I have developed this structure right here for musicians. Now, you're welcome to modify this however you want. So when you download this, if this doesn't really agree with you or you want to rename something, maybe you don't want to call something um, advertising and promo, maybe you want to just call it PR, that's fine. There's not one right way to do things, they're just 
recommendations and guidelines. And so kind of like with music, you know, there's not necessarily a right way to play music, but you know, if you're trying to play music that's in a key and you're trying to use certain chords, then you do have some rules and guidelines you need to stick to. And so it is with accounting. These are all different types of expense accounts that I've developed for my business. You might have others, so you can always add them. And yeah, this goes on and on. So I'm, I'm just going to say that if you want to check this out, it'll be available after the presentation and uh, Austin Music Foundation can give you the link to download it. All right, so getting back to the presentation here. Last section I'm going to talk to you guys is about two different methods of accounting. One is called accrual basis accounting, one is called cash basis accounting. So let's talk about accrual basis first. This is a method of accounting in which income or expenses are recorded when the transaction occurs rather than when a payment is received or made. Cash basis accounting says we're going to record income and expenses when a payment is made or received. In other words, when cash is exchanged. And you're like, hold on a minute, what? I'm going to give you an example. It'll make sense, I promise. Here's a good example. Let's say on December 30th, you send an invoice to a client, $100 for some audio engineering work. And then on January 3rd, the client pays the invoice. So we can already see that with cash basis and accrual basis, the question becomes, all right, well, when did you actually earn that money? If you're using accrual basis accounting, you recognize the income as of the date of the invoice because that's the date in which the invoicing track transaction occurs. So if you sent the invoice this year, your income for $100 would be recorded in 2020. Cash basis says, well, I'm not going to record that income until I receive my payment. So using the cash basis method, you would record your income as received January 3rd. So you can see in this example right here, you actually are dealing with two different calendar years. So it's really important to ask yourself, okay, am I using accrual basis accounting or cash basis accounting to determine when I earned this income? Brings me to my next slide. Which method should I use? I get this question a lot. People want to know, okay, well, I get it. I get that there's two different ways to track everything, but what's the best way? What is the right way to do this? And my answer is, well, it depends. However, I will give you guys a recommendation. So if you have a corporation other than an S corp, so a C corporation, and you're averaging more than $25 million in income per year, the IRS requires you to use accrual basis accounting for reporting your accounting. I don't think any of you fall into that category, if I'm not mistaken. So it's also recommended that you use accrual based accounting if your business is based around selling inventory. This is really the best method. So you, there might be a couple of you in here that might be online if you're like a music if you're like a CD store or, or LP store, you're selling product and that's all you do, I would probably recommend accrual basis accounting. But if you don't fall into one of these two categories, you're going to want to use a cash base method because honestly, uh, I think that's going to probably apply to 99% of you here. And it's the easy it's a pretty easy way to, to manage things. Uh, there's a little bit less that is involved with cash basis accounting. 
accrual basis is a little more complex and that comes into play with how you record your accounting transactions. And I could probably spend an entire hour or two hours talking about that. I'm not, but really, I just want you to be aware of what these two methods are, what they mean, and how you do this. Now, if you use accounting software like QuickBooks, when you run reports in QuickBooks, it'll ask you, do you want a cash basis report or an accrual basis report? So going back to the example that I just used with when you're earning that income, if you run a report in QuickBooks for your income, if you are using a cash-based report and you're running that report for this year, then you're not going to see it because you didn't actually receive that money until next year. Now, if you're running an accrual basis report, you will see that income this year. So accounting software can make it a lot easier to kind of manage this. And so, you know, I think just stick with cash basis. You should be fine. I ended a little bit early because I think there are a lot of questions and I want to get to as many as I can. So I will now bring it back to Johnny to Hello. read off the questions. Hey, Johnny. How you doing? Aaron, great job tonight. Um, I, we have a question. It is, uh, if you contract in other ways, do you need to separate accounts for each additional 1099 topic? Good question. Okay. So, yes. Uh, so, I, if I understand this correctly, I think what, what this person is asking is, so, uh, maybe if you have different businesses. So, like, let's say, um, you know, a good example is me, right? I have two businesses. I have the Accountable Artist and I have Aaron Clift Productions. And Aaron Clift Productions is my music business and the Accountable Artist is my accounting business. So I might hire the same person. In fact, I have a friend who is a videographer. He's done work for my band. I'm about to hire him to do some work for the Accountable Artist. So in a case like that, yes, I would prepare separate uh he's going to be an independent contractor if, if you guys are familiar with what it, i think a lot of you might be familiar with 1099s but uh 1099 is the form that you are going to send an independent contractor that says here's how much i paid you in the year and so if i paid my friend 800 dollars for my band and i paid him 600 dollars from the accountable artist, then I actually do need to send him two separate 1099s because I have separate tax IDs for each of my businesses. So I, I hope that answered the question. All right. Uh, the next question is, how do you find affordable tax professionals who are equipped to support independent workers and contractors in our industry? Yes, good question. So I... I think for finding help with preparing taxes, yes, we, one of the things I was talking about with saving time and money is that CPAs do charge a lot for their services. I mean, there's, they spent years and years training. They're like the doctors of the accounting world. I like to think of myself as more like a nurse. So you know, <laughs> nurse, nurses are, are kind of more involved with the day-to-day -day operations of, you know, taking care of, of a patient and, kind of more involved in kind of the general well-being of the patient. And so I am involved with your well-being. If, if you were working with me, I would help you kind of understand all those things. So the doctor, yes, they could help you with a lot of your well-being, but, you know, they're going to charge you a lot more and because of all the training they've gone through. So the way I think of it is if you are a business owner, you're going to want to do as much of your bookkeeping work ahead of time because if you if you present a bunch of receipts to a CPA and say, uh, okay, I need my taxes done, they're going to say, all right, can you show me your books? And if you're like, well, I don't have any. If, 
if I were the CPA, I'd say, all right, well, you need to go back and, and uh, send me, you know, a summary of all your transactions. Otherwise, you're asking me to book everything for you. Well, the average CPA is probably going to charge you anything from one to $200 an hour. You don't want to spend that kind of money on a CPA if you could do it yourself. So definitely um, you want to save some money that way. As for finding a CPA and finding somebody affordable, I can recommend uh, asking Austin Music Foundation if they know anybody. But there are organizations out there that do this um, pro bono. I know that uh, Texas Accountants and Lawyers for the Arts is a, an excellent organization. And they have, I've actually worked with them before. They've helped pair me up with a lawyer. I had a question about preparing a band member agreement and I got free legal advice. And if you know anything about lawyers, man, they charge a lot. Uh, so, uh, and they have CPAs that work for them. So if you are in need of finding somebody either pro bono or low cost, that might be a good place to start or asking AMF for a recommendation. Of course, I know several CPAs and if you email me, I'd be happy to refer you to them. Great, thanks, Aaron. Hey, can we go back to the first question? Uh, mm -hmm. The one about- Ah, uh, oh, yes, I see it in the chat here. About, about contracting in other mm -hmm. ways, yeah. This question was uh, asking more about miscellaneous things like Lyft, Postmates, catering, et cetera. Ah, uh, yes. that just go into a personal under QuickBooks self-employed? Um, yes, you, well, if it's personal finances, QuickBooks is meant for business. So if you need a way to track personal finances, there are software programs out there that do that. Um, Mint is one. I use Quicken. Uh, but really what we're talking about here tonight is your business. So what you need to ask yourself is, okay, what am I in business to do? So I'm assuming everybody here is a musician or you're somehow involved in the music industry. So that should be what you put on your books for your business income. If you're doing stuff like Lyft driving, um, doing stuff for Uber Eats, anything like that, that I would consider that personal income. I would not put that in your business books. And so if you are doing kind of side hustle, things like that, then you're going to either, if, if that side hustle is enough to really be considered like its own business, I would start, you know, I would do separate business books for that. But if it's like, yeah, I do a little bit of lift driving here and there that, that might just be, I might just call that personal income. I mean, it's, you think about it, think about it the other way around. Let's say, let's say you are employed by a company, right? If you're employed by company A, then they're going to issue, you know, they're going to issue a W-2 to you. you company B is not going to, if you work for another company, and I know people who have more than one job, company B is not going to issue you a W-2 for the work that you did for company A. So I, I really think in this particular case, yeah, going back to what I said about commingling, just keep your business and your personal stuff separate. And if you do have more than one line of business, you got to decide, all right, like in my case, I do accounting consulting and I do business uh, and I do my music stuff. Those two are not related. So they do not belong in the same company. So you got to ask yourself, okay, is what I'm doing part of this company or not? So you might, you might have, um, if you're a music manager, maybe you offer a lot of different services to somebody that can all be part of one company. But if it's like, yeah, you're a music manager, but then you're also like a ballet dancer. And then you're like also a photographer. Those are three different businesses. So um, I hope I answered that question. Yeah. Um, here's another question that has to do with commingling. Do you recommend sole proprietors getting an EID number for their business so they won't be using their social mm. security number at tax time or in any other instance, using the social security number would be commingling as well, right? Okay, so uh, the answer to that is no, it is not commingling. So uh, when you, the moment you 
have a profit motive and you're pursuing an activity, you know, you're in business, right? So you don't necessarily have to go to the IRS and file a bunch of paperwork and say, here's the name of my company. You're just doing business as yourself. So if I decided tomorrow, you know what, I want to start taking photographs uh, of, I want to do music photography and I want to make money at it. So the moment I decide to do that, I'm in business and I, and like somebody pays me $300 to photograph them. Okay. Well, I am doing business as Aaron Clift. I am, if I want to incorporate later and call myself Aaron Clift Photography, I could do that. But uh, to answer this question, the moment you are doing business, you know, you are doing it as yourself under your social security number. That is not commingling. The point of commingling is really you want to keep your personal finances over here, your business finances over here. You want to separate the two. So I realize, you know, you have your social security number and that is you personally, but you got to think of it like, okay, I'm Aaron Clift, the person, and then there's Aaron Clift, the musician. They have the same social security number, but one of them is a business operation and one of them is just me. And so you can use your social security number. Now, a lot of people say, you know what? I want to have a separate tax ID. I don't want to use my social security number for my business. And so that's where you would fill out a form with the IRS and and um, apply for a separate tax ID and they can assign that to you. And you can get that if you are a sole proprietor, if you're a corporation, a limited liability company, that doesn't really matter. Really the point of, of this is that you just got to think of yourself as, you know, I'm over here, I'm doing my music work. I'm over here just doing my personal stuff and they are separate. Okay, that's great. Um, Aaron, what's the difference between accounts payable and expenses? Ah, yes. Uh, well, my answer to that is next week. I will really dive into that. But when um, the best way I can think of it is as an expense is this goes to kind of like cash basis versus accrual basis. But when you pay an expense, you know, there's your expense, right? But if you owe money to somebody, you haven't actually given, you haven't given that person any cash yet. You're just saying, I owe you money. So that I owe you goes into accounts payable. And then once you pay it, then it's your expense. That's under cash basis accounting. Okay. But next week, yes, I I will go into depth about how all these accounts kind of interact with each other. We're going to talk all about debits and credits. All right. Um, this is a good one. Uh, this guy is not a musician. He publishes comic books and wants to know if he should use accrual-based accounting. Accounting. Sorry. Hmm. Okay. Um, it depends, but I would say you could probably do a cash basis accounting because if you're publishing comic books, like, okay, are you going to have a lot of inventory? Are you going to have a lot of physical product that you're selling? Because I don't know how the book publishing industry works. I assume the publishers probably, you know, they're generating a lot of physical product that they're going to sell to people. So yeah, he's, he says he's moving physical product. Okay. Um, you might be a good candidate for accrual-based accounting, but a lot of it's going to depend on certain factors. You may want to ask a CPA about this one because since I don't know your particular situation, it's hard to know precisely what to recommend to you. But I'd say uh, if, you, if you're going to be primarily moving a lot of inventory, then yeah, you might want to look into accrual accounting. It could kind of go either way. So I'd say the ultimate decision would be you might want to consult a CPA. They can ask you everything about your business and they'll probably give you a determining. They'll say, yeah, do it this way. Okay. Uh, Here's another question. I'd like to know what and how I have to save for taxes. 
if I do everything with a debit card, are my bank statements enough or do I need individual receipts? Yes. So I always recommend keeping receipts for everything. So you want to keep you want to keep records of what you're doing because really what what are you doing with accounting? You are telling the story of your business, right? And you can think of it it's kind of like if you're writing a song, you need to tell a story, right? So if you have a song with vocals, you are telling a story with lyrics, and you're telling a story somehow. So you want to ha- you want to keep track of all those things. I recommend um for keeping receipts, there's a lot of ways you can do that. QuickBooks actually lets you attach a file to a transaction. They even have a way that you can take a picture of it with your camera, with their app, and then it uploads into QuickBooks. So it's super easy. You don't have to keep track of any paper stuff. Uh, I'm, I love paperless, so I'm, I'm a big fan of that. Uh, if you're into paper, you know, you can have a filing cabinet with folders. There, I used to do that many years ago before I discovered the paperless method. But uh, yes, you definitely want to keep track of this stuff because, and I'll tell you why, I've worked with clients before who only refer to their bank statements 10 months from now, and you look at a bank statement, right? And you're looking at all these transactions, and usually these statements don't give you a lot of information about it. They might have a truncated vendor name and you're looking at this you're like okay ten dollars from home depot is that a business expense is that personal like why did i go there what did i do i wonder if this person though is saying that Mm -hmm. they use their debit card like their business debit card i don't know if they mean personally i would assume yeah i'm not sure either uh if you're using your personal debit card like you're going to want to get away from that as soon as possible and open a, a business banking account because if you're using a personal card, you know, the, again, going back to this example here, let's say 10 months from now, you're looking at a bank statement and right. it's your per, it's your personal account, right? And you have a purchase from Home Depot and you're looking at that and you're like, did I go to Home Depot for a home repair or did I get like some supplies there for my music video shoot? I don't remember. Well, if you don't keep if if you don't keep good records of this stuff, it's really hard to know. So I recommend keep all your receipts, um, book this stuff in QuickBooks or other accounting software, so you know why you did that thing, and try to not commingle as much as possible. And uh, real quick, what would you recommend for keeping track of the receipts? QuickBooks. Um, QuickBooks is a good way. So like when. When I book a transaction in QuickBooks, there's a spot at the bottom. So, you know, you'll enter all the information about the transaction. You might enter a memo so you can describe what you did. Right. And then there's a place to attach a receipt. So you got everything. And if anybody ever audits you in the future, you just pull it up. You're like, hey, okay, so I went I went to this restaurant. I had lunch with uh, my manager. We talked about this stuff. And here's the receipt. Boom, you got everything there. I bet a lot of people are cringing right now just because of the date. And they didn't do this before. That's all right. You know, I, I it's never too late to start. I think, you know, if QuickBooks, if the idea of getting accounting software is a little too much, um, there's other ways to do it. You could have a folder on Dropbox or Google Drive where you put all, you just take a picture of your receipt with your phone, put it in there. Just put everything in there. Maybe add a little memo field, some notes about what, what it was for. You could do that. Um, Airtable is a program that I use. It's, it's kind of like Excel and a database mixed together. And you can use that to store records and keep track of things too. Yeah. These are really good sort of like financial habits to get into. Are mm-hmm. there any recommendations? Uh, this isn't a question from anyone, just a follow up sort of like practices to start developing these, these practices as habits. Yes. So one of the things, so I, I try not to do too many advertisements or plugs for, for what I do, but this is relevant. Um, I do a six week course one-on-one with artists so 
and I talk about this on my website, which I'll give you a link to in a moment. But my my philosophy is really not only teaching you how to do something, but it's not enough to just teach somebody how to do something. You need to t show somebody how to do that thing and how to repeat it over and over and over again. Because if I teach you how to play a scale and then you and you learn that scale, but then you don't practice that and you don't know how to play a song, what's the point, right? That's right. just a bunch of notes in your head. So I really go into depth when I work one-on-one -on -one with people about, okay, you know, all the stuff that I teach tonight is in lesson one. All the stuff next week is in lesson two. Lessons three and four, I get into showing you how to use QuickBooks, but I also gear everything to the individual. So um, everybody learns and does things a little bit differently. So some people might be like, you know what? I want to look at my bank account and get my transactions every single day. For other people, they're like, whoa, that's too much. I am so busy. I don't want to look at that stuff. So I try to find a happy medium between doing it too much to where it's like interfering with you getting other activities done versus not doing it frequently enough that you're not really getting your accounting story, you know, and getting your house in order. Right. So it's kind of like that with practicing too, you know, you, you're not going to necessarily gain a lot from practicing. I mean, you might practice six hours straight, but chances are you're going to overwhelm yourself and you're going to need to take a break. So it's better to practice like, you know, in chunks, right? So I try to find the best way that works for each person for kind of chunking that so that this stuff is not so overwhelming and so it's repeatable. So, um, you know, I can't speak to the person who asked this question or, you know, or anybody specifically on this webinar, but I will say just think about how you tend to work best and think about what method is going to be best for you to be consistent about this. Yeah, I mean, it seems like if you could sync that up with your phone that like even like say you're on the road oh, to, yeah, yeah. to a place to play a gig, like right when you get back in the car from getting the gas, you take a picture of the receipt, say what, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. If you can develop that sort of like uh, that sort of habit, you'll be in good shape. Yeah, and you know, QuickBooks Online, um, QuickBooks Online is actually really good about this because you can use it on your laptop as long as you have an internet connection, they have a phone app, syncs perfectly. I've never had any issues with that. And so that is to me like the big plus of using software like that is, yeah, when you're on the go, you're moving around, whenever we get to tour again in the future, whenever yeah. this pandemic is over, yeah. you know, that's gonna be, that's gonna be important. And you wanna make, you want it to be convenient and easy and it's, got to also be something that's accurate. And so I think finding a, a good way to get kind of both of that in order is important. Right. On, on that same note, do you recommend e just using QuickBooks or possibly syncing QuickBooks with a spreadsheet program like Google Sheets as a backup? That's a question ah, from, yes. the, uh, okay. from the comments. So comments. Um, earlier when I talked about the, the concept of your general ledger, right? Your books. QuickBooks will handle all that for you. Um, what you're describing here is, so if you have QuickBooks, right? And that's that's keeping track of all your financial transactions. You may, I've seen a lot of people do this. Like, let's say you use CD Baby for your, aggre your digital aggregator. So, you know, maybe, maybe you want to download their reports that have like, all your sales, you know, here's all the money you earned from Spotify and all that stuff. You might download all that information and that could be called what a sub ledger. So that sub ledger, it's just, you know, extra details about your sales, but that might be a lot of information to have to deal with in QuickBooks. So QuickBooks might be kind of like summarizing, you know, all your sales for a month. That's what I do. So I do like CD Baby pays me, you know, they pay me like 20 bucks here and there. So I say, all right, 
I earn twenty dollars in my digital sales, and I record the date that that's done. And if I want to get really nitty gritty into detail about that, I might just download one of their reports. And if anybody asks me in the future, hey, wh- you said you earned twenty dollars. Like, what's what's the deal with this? Can you give me more information? So, uh, yes, it is. You can use a spreadsheet to kind of supplement, but try to think, try to do your day-to-day accounting in QuickBooks because it's going to be so much easier. Um, it'll generate all the reports you need. Um, something you said about the streaming uh, income. Mm-hmm. There's a question that came in before we did this. That was what types of services would you recommend for artists to manage their streams and digital sales that can be linked to an accounting service? Is that, ah. is that a thing? Yes. Um, what I would recommend is, so it depends on who you're using. I use CD Baby for my band. I know a lot of people use TuneCore and DistroKid. Bandcamp is another, I, I use Bandcamp as well for selling um, merch and physical product. Uh, so QuickBooks actually does a really excellent job of, you know, you can get into nitty gritty like, hey, I've got all these all these lines of t-shirts, right? You can link all those to the same income account. So when you get your report, it'll show you a summary of here's, you know, I earned a hundred dollars in t- in merchandise sales, but if I want to do another report to see, okay, but I earned a hundred dollars in merch sales, but how many black t-shirts did I sell? If you have it set up in QuickBooks a certain way, yes, you can drill down that way. Um, as far as integration with these services, um, I haven't done that, although I'm sure there's probably ways to do that. QuickBooks has um, a marketplace kind of like, um, if you ever use WordPress or something like that, you know, WordPress has plugins that you can use for, for designing your website. And so QuickBooks does have some kind of plugins, if you will, that can enhance how it works. So, uh, you know, you might look into that. There might be some, there might be some services that integrate completely with QuickBooks. Great. Um, all right, we have a long question. Are you ready? Yep. All right. We have been incorporated as a C Corp since 2002 when we formed a small group in order to be, sorry, in order to be able to get health insurance. Since medical expenses are significant, a significant yearly expense, we have maintained our C Corp status, but we are being taxed extra as personal service providers our income is falling significantly in the past four to five years, and we now get insurance through the exchange. When might we know it's not worth keeping a C Corp status? We paid 20,000 in medical expenses last year, and that was a significant portion of our income. Yeah, so uh, I can tell you from my own personal experience, um, my day job uh, that I'm at right now when I started in 2007, we had about 10 employees and then the, the company started, it's a IT consulting company, you know, it started growing and growing over the years. And that was always a concern we had was, Hey, we're going to offer health insurance for more employees and that can be very expensive. So I totally get where you're coming from. And especially when you have a very small group of people, it can, the cost per person per premium is much higher than if you had a larger group. Uh, What I would say as far as your business organization goes, really that there are so many factors that go into that. If I were working with you, I would probably do some due diligence. You know, I'd have to ask you a lot of questions, audit your finances, take a look at it and make a recommendation that way. What I would suggest you do is talk to a CPA about that because they're going to be able to tell you the best move for how to save money on taxes and really how your business should be incorporated. Okay. 
If you need to save money on a CPA, um, like I said before, Texas Accountants and Lawyers for the Arts, great organization. Um, I highly recommend them. Okay. Do you want to quickly sort of like, uh, how will people be able to find all those handouts and stuff? Uh, so I believe, if I'm not mistaken, Austin Music Foundation, uh, I sent you guys the the presentation that okay. happened tonight. So uh, I believe AMF be is going to make that available. If you guys need more information, if you want to contact me directly, this is my contact information here. It's the accountableartist.com. And if you sign up for my mailing list, my email list, I actually, um, the the presentation tonight, the first part of it, where I talked about the dangers of commingling and kind of how to get your business started. Right. Uh, I have a free, I call it the ultimate business starter list or uh, a starter guide. And that is free if you want to subscribe to my newsletter. So you'll get that too. And all uh, of the, oh, sorry, all of the information will be available at austinmusicfoundation.org. Mm -hmm. Yep. If you guys have specific questions for me or uh, want to work with me, then, um, you know, I'd say e email address right here. Great. I have a, uh, another question for you. Mm -hmm. Earlier in the night, you mentioned uh, SBA loans. I recently obtained one. I've approached business consultants about the best way to use the loan, but a lot of them are unsure on how to deal with anything in the arts. Is this something I'm better figuring out on my own or are there creative business consultants and I'm just not finding them? Okay. So if I understand the question correctly, it's really, so I'm assuming this, this person, uh, okay. So this person obtained a loan. Uh, I'm guessing if it's, yes. if it's probably the, the ones that, so the small business administration does offer loans to businesses and usually uh, now this, this year is very unusual because a lot of the loans that they've been offering are kind of no strings attached kind right. of loans. They're very, uh, they're designed to help businesses that are struggling right now because of the recession. Uh, normally with an SBA loan, and I've worked with several businesses who have applied for them, they're, they're going to ask you a lot of questions about your business. They'll audit your finances. They'll ask for you know, your last few years of tax forms. They'll ask you to show your, um, you know, your income and loss from your business. And they'll probably ask for a business plan too. So what I would recommend for you in this particular case is if you're, if you've obtained this money, that's, that's excellent. I mean, most people don't get that kind of financing, but so you're sitting on this money, you're trying to figure out what's the best thing to do with it. Um, go to your business plan. If you have not developed a business plan, uh, I would suggest, you know, you can Google, there's lots of articles out there about how to write a business plan, but that's where I would start is go back and figure out, okay, what, what am I trying to do here? How am I going to earn money and start? And I always say when you're, when you're setting goals, right, you want to kind of have the big pie in the sky goal. What is your big goal? Okay. So my big goal with the accountable artist is I want to earn my entire living teaching accounting skills to creative entrepreneurs. So that's my big goal, right? So then I'm like, okay, well, how much do I need to earn in order to achieve that goal? How much do I need to earn in five years? How much do I need to earn three years? How much do I need to earn this year? How much do I need to earn this month? So you take your goal, break it down into smaller pieces. Uh, that's kind of where having a business plan and a framework like that can help you. So that's what I would recommend to you if you're trying to figure out, hey, what am I going to use my money for? Start that way. Great. Um, so we have part two of the accounting crash course coming next Wednesday, July 8th, at the same time as tonight at 7 p.m. Uh, you want to give a little bit of a preview before we before we say goodnight here? Yeah. So this week, what we what we did, um, let me go back to the first slide here. So because I had the, the outline here. Okay, yeah. We're getting it all going here tonight. 
Yeah. So the just to review for next week as well. Yeah. This week, what we this week you can kind of think of this if you're a musician, like okay, this week we talked about here are the notes, here are the key signatures, here's your time signatures, right? You know all all the building blocks of music. So next week, I'm going to show you how those building blocks interact with each other and create accounting transactions. So tonight, all about the theory. Next week, we're going to actually look at how these transactions get posted and reported. So that's kind of like, and we're going to get into some theoretical concepts next week, but it's kind of like, you know, when you're learning algebra, you're learning about how does an equation work, right? Well, if you're using a calculator, you're probably not thinking about that, but you still need to know what these things are, like the the kind of the concept behind it. And so it is with this. So what I show you guys next week is kind of the maybe the longhand way of doing, you know, addition and subtraction. When you do this stuff in QuickBooks, you may not be thinking about it quite as directly, but you need to understand why, why you're doing this. That's great. Well, thank you so much. Uh, this has been a very informative presentation. Uh, thank you so much to Aaron Clift of The Accountable Artist for partnering with us, the Cultural Arts Division for its continued support, and all of you for tuning in. Aaron, thank you so much. That was very, very great. I really appreciate it. And yeah, I'm thank sure thank you guys so much for having me. And like I said, if you if you guys need if you have more questions about any of the stuff that we went over tonight, uh, I'll let you copy down this information. My website is theaccountableartist.com. Contact at theaccountableartist.com. Please feel free to email me any questions about any of the stuff I went over tonight, or if if I didn't get quite quite get to it, I'm happy to answer your questions. Thanks, man. And don't forget, please be sure to join us again for part two of our Accounting Crash Course series next Wednesday, July 8th at 7 p.m. Lastly, thank you to the AMF team, especially Emily Miller for all of her help putting this together, our amazing music support nonprofit partners, and many other groups who are working hard to inform, create, and navigate efforts related to COVID-19. Remember, we're all in this together. Have a great night. Stay safe and be healthy. Night, Aaron. Take care.